says Ocean Gate CEO ignored early warning signs that the material used to build the submersible wasn't safe. ABC7 News reporter Lena Howland brings us this story. Long before a Titan submersible carrying five people on a quest to see the Titanic wreckage lost all communications before later imploding came the early warnings. We all told him, you know, someone is going to be killed in this thing and you, you've got to not do it. OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush paid a visit to Alameda back in 2015 while he was in the thick of building his submersible to meet with Liz Taylor. Taylor is a deep sea engineer and president of DOER Marine Operations where they build their own submersibles. He wanted to hear her findings from a research project. Stockton felt like he was pushing the edge. You want to push the envelope use some new materials. And that's when Taylor specifically advised against the use of carbon fiber, as it's still experimental and has not been tested over time in extreme depths of the ocean. It being hollow on the inside or just, you know, one atmosphere on the inside and having the tremendous pressure of the ocean you know, trying to push in on it, it just doesn't it's not not the right material. Then in 2018, the manned submersible committee of the Marine Technological Society backed her up, writing a letter also urging Rush not to proceed. Ignoring all warnings, he moved forward. So where this really went kind of askew was that it was like, I don't need that. You know, <laughs> I've done the math. You know, I'm confident in my engineering. Taylor says Rush cut obvious corners, like not building his sub in a pair to have self-rescue capacity or with what's called an ROV. That's a remotely operated vehicle that can serve as a self-rescue tool. There was no capable ROV on board. There was no second submersible. And she says because Rush was technically operating in international waters, there was no way of stopping him. So when this happened through this, this combination of, you know, hubris, complacency and greed, it was incredibly frustrating and, and so sad for the families that they didn't have, maybe they just had no idea of the true level of risk that they were putting themselves at. In Alameda, Lena Howland, ABC 7 News. Okay, so let's talk about it. So what we're going to kind of go into is, right, about how this free market narrative is a free lie. And let me know that you can hear me. Let me know a part of the country that you're coming out of. I know we're going into a 4th of July holiday, so I appreciate everybody for coming through. You can go ahead and watch the video and get back to the barbecue, whatever you're going to do this weekend, right? And what we're talking about is that this free market narrative, it actually is a lie. It's really a, um, a you know, it's a, it's a, a lie, but it also can be considered like a mythology kind of based on a lot of idealism. And so mythology can be very powerful because it can get people to believe in it without having any real evidence to back it up. And what I mean by that is that a lot of people promote this narrative of a free market, right? Being the most ideal market, a market without any government regulation, without government coming in and creating rules and regulations around how we manage ourselves in this particular uh, market. And they make it seem like it's ideal. If we could just get the government out of the way, because um, private business is going to be much more efficient. But did you notice they have their golden cows around the free market? A lot of people that promote this, like policing and things of that nature, they don't want ever that to be privatized. They just want this belief that the government is so inefficient, unless it's the military, about doing their job. If we just pull them out and pull all their regulations out and then allow people to just do whatever they want to do business wise, that will create the most efficient market where markets are really inefficient, which is why I can make money trading them. However, the person has to understand the market to understand that. And we're going to kind of go into that. And these are the kind of conversations that I really want to have on this channel. But they require people to do a lot of understanding of the material. And the reason why these people can promote these particular ideas like Miss Owens or Mr. Kirk is because they understand the audience that they're talking to doesn't understand enough about the material to even be able to have a, a sufficient conversation about it. Now, really quickly, right, because we're talking about the markets, right? If you want to have a better understanding of how to leverage the financial markets to get the life that you desire, I want you to go to www.thehighestpaid.online. We have been successful in teaching people the truth around the market, what actually takes place in the market, to get out of this idealism and this ideology and this mythology and understand how the markets actually work to put yourself in a position where you can get profit out of any market once you understand the fundamentals of the market. And the one thing that we've been better at doing than a lot of other people, including people that got education backgrounds, things of that nature, is getting people to understand how markets actually function in the real world 
to put themselves in a position right to get money out of the market. So here's my basic premise that I'm going to start off with, right? Understand this. There are no free markets. People build markets to exert control over them and the market actors. I'm going to repeat myself. There are no free markets. Nobody builds a market so people can act in the market freely. So why would I spend my time, money, energy, and resources to build a market to only allow anybody to come into the market to do whatever they want to do in the market? And I don't impose any control over the market, but I had to build the marketplace. That doesn't make any sense. So right now, Amazon is going to be sued by the government because what they're saying is that they're they're creating too much control over their vendors inside the market. And they're creating an unfair marketplace. But Amazon built that market to exert control over vendors. Amazon did not take money to build a market to where vendors could come into the market and do whatever they want to do inside the marketplace that Amazon built. It doesn't work that way. That's not why people build markets. There is no incentive to build a market. There is no incentive to build a market, right, to allow other people to come into a market that you've built and for you to conduct themselves any way that they want to, unless you're not that intelligent of a person. But because people don't really see an incentive to understand how markets function, they've been able to just exist inside somebody else's market and they feel like they're getting what they want to get out of that other person's market. They don't see any incentive to understand markets and also understand how to build their own markets. Right. That's really going to be the final frontier for a lot of people that are independent minded. So let's go ahead and get into it. Right. Let's get into the definition of free markets. OK, so based on Britannica, free market is an unregulated system of economic exchange in which taxes, quality controls, quotas, tariffs and other forms of centralized economic interventions or interventions, excuse me, by government either do not exist or are minimal. As a free market represents a benchmark that does not actually exist. Modern societies can only approach or approximate this idea of efficient resource allocation and can be described along a spectrum ranging from high to low amounts of regulation, right? So we talked about a unregulated system of economic exchange. So what these people are advocating for is for markets to be unregulated. I'm not advocating, I'm not advocating for markets to be regulated. What I'm saying is that there are no such thing as free markets. Nobody's going to spend their time, money, energy, and their resources to build a marketplace for people to come into that marketplace and they're not going to look to exert control over the marketplace that they built. Right. That's not how the real world works. It doesn't work that way. And so it's very interesting that people are supposed to be so common sense. They're supposed to be so pragmatic. They're supposed to be um, so fact based and evidence based will create this idea that, well, the world will work better if we just all engaged in free markets. And we're going to kind of show you that. This is a mythology that they're promoting or they were promoting at one time because that was a way for them to create conversation, for them to polarize people. But they don't really believe in that. Anglo-Saxons do not believe in free markets. If you look at how they conduct themselves all over this world, they, there's no evidence historical that Anglo-Saxons or people like Miss Owens that are confederates of Anglo-Saxons, that they believe in free markets. So the tribe that Miss Owens is attached to, they don't believe in free markets. Right. Mr. Kirk, Anglo-Saxon, does not believe in free markets. There is no historical evidence in 2023 going back to the beginning of time to show me that Anglo-Saxons really believe in practice of free markets. They don't. They believe in controlling markets to the best benefit of their group. They do not believe in free markets. So I won't have a bad faith conversation with an Anglo-Saxon around free markets because there's no historical evidence that they practice this idea of markets being free. Let's keep going. Right. So let's go into this Ocean Gate, this deal, right? So here's an article from, I want to say, the New York Times. Years before Ocean Gate's craft went missing, the company faced several warnings that it prepared for its hallmark mission of taking wealthy passengers to the Titanic's wreckage, right? So Director of Main Operations, David Lockridge, started working a report. And he said that the craft needed more testing and he stressed the potential dangers to passengers of the Titan as a submersible reached extreme deaths. And we're looking at the particular uh, mission that they went on or expedition. I heard it took two hours to get to the bottom because we know that the Titanic is at the bottom of the ocean and it's at the bottom of a very, very deep part of the ocean. Right. So that particular craft had to be able to withstand that pressure as we're getting to the bottom. And then it has to be able to withstand that pressure as we're along the bottom of the actual ocean. Then it has to be able to withstand the pressure of being able to come back up. So two months later, after he issued this particular document, Ocean Gate got calls from more than three dozen people, industry leaders, 
deep sea explorers, and also other oceanographers who warned to Stockton Rush, who was the CEO of that particular company, that the company's experimental approach and its decision to forego a traditional assessment could lead to a potential catastrophic problems with that particular mission, right, to go to see the Titanic. So the critiques from Lockridge and experts who signed a 2008 letter to Mr. Rush characterized on Mr. Rush's refusal to have the Titan, the Titan expected and certified by some of the leading agencies that do the work, right? So Mr. Lockridge reported in court records, he urged the company to do so, but he was told that Ocean Gate was unwilling to pay for such an assessment. After getting Mr. Lockridge's report, the company leaders held a tense meeting to discuss the situation, according to court documents filed by both sides. And let me see. The letter stated that Ocean Gate's marketing of the Titan had been at minimum misleading because it claimed that the submersible would meet or exceed the safety standards of a risk assessment company known as DNV, even though the company had no plans to have the craft formally certified by the agency. OK. Submersibles are largely unregulated particularly when they operate in international waters. That's a key point that you want to that you want to remember. Submersibles, unlike boats and other vessels, are un largely unregulated, particularly when they operate in international waters. Because the Titan is loaded on a Canadian ship, then dropped into the North Atlantic near the, near the Titanic, it does not need to register with a country, fly a flag, or follow rules that apply to many other vessels. The Passenger Vessel Safety Act of 1993 which regulates submersibles that carry passengers and requires that they be registered with the Coast Guard does not apply to the Titan because it does not fly an American flag or operate in American waters. So here's what you want to understand. And I'm going to say this and all everything I'm getting ready to tell you is supposition. It's my own opinion. Um, and it's not meant to defame the Ocean Gate organization, company, whatever, whatever. This guy created this particular vertical and he didn't want to get any uh, regulation and it wasn't even government or state regulation. He didn't want any governing body over what he was doing because he believed in a free market. He believed that the marketplace would sort out all the problems. But I want you to understand something. He knew he could not operate in certain waters because by operating in those waters, he would then have to submit to some level of government regulation. So what did he do as a value proposition? We're going to go visit the Titanic. Because he understood if I operate in international waters and if I follow a certain process, no government agency can stop me from doing what I'm doing. So I'm, allay, I'm allowed to engage in the type of business I want to engage in. I don't have to worry about any kind of regulation and nobody can stop me. And that's why he created that value proposition. There's a lot of things to go see in the world that are underneath the water. But the reason why they went after the Titanic, because what? It's in international waters. So no government can dictate to me how I have to go about doing it. Then he charged rich people a lot of money to go see the Titanic. Even I don't know what is down there that you want to go see. That's what he used to finance, right? More, more money into the company. And I think there was on a third or fourth trip and they all perished. Okay. Now I don't have a problem with him doing what he did. I, Listen to a guy on NPR. He took one of the voyages. He says that you sign a very long waiver and they state multiple times in the waiver that you can die on that trip. But here's the issue. If you believe in free markets, if you don't want to engage in any government regulation, if you don't want to deal with any kind of oversight from any kind of board or agency, when things go wrong, you need to keep that same energy. What I'm not a fan of is these people talking free markets, free markets, free markets. And then when it's something that they don't like, now they want the government to come in and play superhero. And we're going to talk about that. So we know that we had a very extensive rescue effort, right, behind this deal. Here's an article from KCRA number three, right? It says the cost for the unprecedented search for the missing tiding submersible would easily stretch it to millions of dollars, experts said on Friday. There's no other comparable ocean search, especially with so many countries and even commercial enterprises being involved in recent times said a particular naval historian based out of Virginia. The aircraft alone are expensive to operate. The government accountability office has put the hourly cost as tens of thousands of dollars. Turboprop P-3 Orion, jet-powered P-8 Poseidon subhunters, along with C-130 Hercules, were all utilized in the search. Some agencies can seek reimbursements, but the U.S. Coast Guard, 
whose bill alone will hit the millions of dollars is genuinely prohibited by federal law from collecting reimbursement pertaining to any search or rescue service, said Stephen, an attorney in Maine who specializes in maritime law. The Coast Guard, as a matter of law and policy, does not seek to recover the costs associated with search and rescue from the recipients of those services, the Coast Guard said Friday in a statement. What we had is a scenario where this guy wanted to engage in certain levels of business. He didn't want to deal with any regulation. It's free market, free market, free market. And then when it goes bad, we now have to marshal government resources that are going to be financed by taxpayers to figure out, one, what happened? Can we recover these people? And then now to give us a report on what happened. Now we got to go through a whole investigation, which is also going to take manpower hours. That's my issue with the free market. The people that advocate for a free market, they only want a free market when it's on the upside of it. When they're now dealing with the downside of the free market, they don't want a free market anymore. So if the government would have said, hey, these guys are operating in international waters. If they die in international waters, that's not our issue because it's in international waters. We don't have any control of what happens in those waters. So what we're going to do is we're not going to offer any rescue. We're going to just walk away. Why is our U.S. Coast Guard operating in international waters? Those are international waters. That was a, a business. That wasn't a government uh, vessel. That was a private vessel engaged in private commerce. If the vessel goes to the bottom of the water, that's what happened. Why should we as taxpayers have to pay for that? And so you don't get this objection from the free market crowd of doing these type of search and rescue efforts because why? It's something that they're personally passionate about. So now it becomes all right for the government to spend taxpayer dollars to engage this particular activity. So this is why I tell you, there are no free markets, right? People build markets to exert control over them and the market actors. The goal of government is to create a business environment that is, it incentivizes people to do business. Now you may not like the rules and you may say, hey, I want to change this rule, change this rule, change this rule. But you don't want to operate in an environment with no rules. You just think you do because it sounds like a cool thing to do. But if you really want to do that, you can just go to the Congo. But if you go to the Congo, somebody may kill you and there's nobody going to look for you. You're just dead. Or somebody may rob you for everything you have and there's no police going to try to show up to get you your property back because there are no rules. It's just everybody does whatever they want to do. And so this is why I'm telling you, don't buy into this idea from these people that we're going to solve all the problems of the world and we're just going to get free markets. No, you're not. Because you don't really want to exist in a free market. What you want to do is exist in a world where people let you do what you want to do at that given time. But you don't want to exist in a world where everybody has the exact same freedom to do what they want to do at that time that you do. Where there are no regulations. And I'm going to show you scenarios where people are existing in an environment as a result of government regulation by still talking about free markets. Okay, let's keep going. So here's a picture of um, a young man working in a coal mine. This is 1909-1913, right? So this guy, this young man is, is, is believed to be between 10 to 12 years old, right? At this particular time in the coal mines, small boys were useful workers being able to climb into the tiniest of caves or mines and light explosives. So besides not receiving the education on time, uh, besides not receiving the education or time to play, many young miners were killed or gravely injured in work accidents, Right? So photographs like this of boys and girls working in these dangerous environments, they, they persuaded people and convinced people in America that child labor was unjust and resulted in laws to make the practice illegal inside the United States. So we existed at one time in a world where even after chattel slavery, people still employed young people. Why? They're cheap. They don't, a young person, an 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old person, they're not going to ask for the same amount of money to work as a grown person. We're not talking about working in entertainment. We're talking about doing a menial, often unskilled labor position. A 12, 13 year old is not going to ask for the same amount of money to do a job as a grown person. Why? They don't have the same responsibilities. Therefore, many employers saw right, it being profitable to employ young people. So then what was happening? We were going to have millions of young people inside the United States who were going to be robbed of their education. They're also going to be robbed of their childhood because why? They were working like grown people as young folks. So what do we do? We came up with child labor laws. But the free market states that if I'm a business owner, right, and this young person's parents 
decide that they want that young person to work, I can hire them if their parents allow it. That's what a free market allows. And then I, as a business owner, has to find out whether or not it makes sense to hire this young person. And as the parents, they can decide whether or not they want that young person to work. The government has come in and said that young people under a certain age can't work jobs. Then if you do, you only can work so many hours, right? So let me find that real quick. Age restrictions, age requirements. The Fair Labor Standards Act sets wage. The Fair Labor Standards Act sets wage, hours, work, and safety requirements for minors, individuals under 18, working in jobs covered by the statute. So the rules vary depending on the age of the minor, the particular job involved. But as a general rule, the FLSA sets 14 years as a minimum age for employment. It limits the number of hours worked by minors under the age of 16, right? So 14 years as a general rule is a minimum age for employment inside the United States, right? This particular child was believed to be 10 to 12 years old. So all the people that believe in free markets and they believe that there should be no regulation on markets, do we believe that we should now allow child labor? And so when you don't really understand how markets function, you get caught into these conversations that sound good to these, you know, we, we're free markets. We believe that, you know, you just let the market decide. When well, the market decided that it wanted to work children like grown people. Why don't we just let that allow? Why don't we just let that happen inside the United States? Do, do we, does the government believe that it's the best benefit for the future of our country to allow children to work like grown folks? Do the states believe it's the best benefit for the future of the state to allow children to work like grown people? Or do they want to come up with regulation that prohibits people working if they're under a certain age? And if they are within a certain age bracket, they can only work so many hours per week. Like I was when I was in high school, I could only work so many hours per week because I was still considered in school. But when you present these people, they're very loud. They're very adamant. And it makes people who are not as confident about what they know. It makes them seem like they actually know what they're talking about. I know how these markets function because I study them on a regular basis. I'm not an actor on the Internet. I actually study these markets on a regular basis. Right. I've proven that I can interact in this market and be profitable. This is not academic to me. Right. So therefore, I'm not a good candidate for what they're talking about. Because I'm going to give them pushback based on how I know these markets actually function. Let's go to the next one, right? Um, we got the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008, right? So that was passed in a response to the subprime mortgage crisis. It authorized the Treasury Secretary to buy up $700 million of troubled assets to restore liquidity in financial markets, right? This was proposed by Henry Paulson, used to work for Goldman Sachs, right? So when they did this particular move, what do we think the result would be if they didn't do the move? If we don't add liquidity back to the markets, what happens to the market? Right. But this was a government policy. This is government regulation it was designed to regulate financial markets. What happens to financial markets? The government does not come in and regulate financial markets. If you can't answer that question, I don't understand how you're going to argue that the government should not regulate financial markets. Because often what you see in other parts of the world is the government does not have the ability to properly regulate its financial market. So the markets often just go haywire because the government does not have the ability. In the United States of America, they've shown there is no extent they won't go to to regulate our markets, to add more liquidity to the markets. They, they won't care. They don't care if we got to put 300 years from now, we have to put those children on the hook. They don't care. They're going to regulate the markets. Because they believe that's the best thing for our country at this current time. They don't want our market to go haywire. They just don't want that to happen. So we've seen time and time again, government policy to regulate markets to do what? To keep confidence in markets. Because if people lose confidence in markets, what do they do? They pull their money out. They take their money somewhere else. Right? So that's what you got to really understand. Just another government policy. Let's talk about Family and Medical Leave Act, right? The Family Medical Leave Act entitles eligible employees to take unpaid job protected leave for specific um, family and medical reasons with continuation of health insurance coverage under the same conditions as if the employee had not taken leave. So eligible employees are entitled to 12 weeks of leave in a 12 month period for the birth of a child and to care for the newborn within one year of birth, 
the placement of an employee of a child, adoption of foster care, the care for an employee's spouse, child, or parent as a serious health condition, a serious health condition that makes the un employee unable to perform the essential functions of her job or um, military active duty. The most important one out of this is the birth of a child to care for the newborn child within one year birth. Now, why is that the most important? Let's say I'm a business owner, right? Why would I hire women if I know they're going to get pregnant? So as a business owner with the Family and Medical Leave Act, I'm hiring a person and I have to continue to provide them health care, right? When they take 12 weeks of leave because the woman got pregnant. Why would I ever hire a woman under those conditions? Why would I just not hire women, just hire men? Because I don't have to worry about the man getting pregnant, even though now the man can get, he can get leave when his wife has a baby. So both can leave the job now, but it used to be just a woman. Why would I ever hire a woman? Why would it make more business sense for me just to hire men because I don't have to worry about men getting pregnant. So a lot of these people that are advocating for this really don't understand what kind of world they're asking for. And they understand the audience that they're talking to doesn't have the understanding of how markets actually function. They don't understand policy. I've yet to meet a person that really talks politics that actually can speak to policy. They just talk like current political events. But they can't speak actual policy. Right. We present policy. We actually talk on the on the on the channel. So now as a as a business owner, how come I can say, well, you know what? I don't want any women on my job because they're going to get pregnant. Well, you know why I can't do that? Because of this regulation. Prohibited employment policies and practice, right? Under laws enforced by the EEOC, it is illegal to discriminate against someone because of the race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, or genetic information, right? So I can't tell a woman I can't hire you because you're going to get pregnant. I can't make it to where she can't get the job because she's going to get pregnant. Because I'm worried about I'm going to uh, I'm going to be in a position where I'm going to lose her. Right. So that's the issue. I can't do that because of this particular law. And so that's what I want people to understand. You'll have people will say, well, we want to do free markets. We're tired of government regulation. But then they turn around and utilize the same government regulation that they claim they're tired of. And there's a rabbit hole that you can go down, especially inside the United States. We have a very robust government. You will be researching for the next 20 years on government regulation that allows this society to function. People don't realize it because they've always had it. So they don't even understand that they're benefiting from all this government regulation. While talking about we want free markets. Sounds cool. Sounds good to go to college students and talk about free markets. They don't have any real world experience. Many of them are not going to be econ majors. So they don't even understand how markets actually function. And they don't understand the importance of government and making sure that markets function properly. Let's go to the next one, right? Here's executive order uh, 138110 from 2017. Impose an additional sanction with respect to North Korea to really quickly just put this in here. You as a, a, a United States citizen with a business inside the United States, you can't do business with North Korea. It's illegal. Right. Uh, Section 1A, all property, interest in property that are in the U.S. that hereafter come within the United States or that are or hereafter come within possession or control of any United States person or the following persons are blocked and may not be transferred, paid, exported, withdrawn or otherwise dealt in. Then we go into Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of State, anything dealing with North Korea, you can't do business with them, right? You can't even really do business with another business that does business with North Korea. You, you got to be hands off. Well, that's coming from the State Department. This is an executive order filed by uh, President Trump when he was in office. United States, new U.S. Iran sanctions provisions require your more diligence on parts of both foreign and U.S. firms, including financial institutions. Uh, under U.S. law, U.S. companies are prohibited from doing business in or with Iran or with the government of Iran or Iran nationals or companies under the Iran transaction regulations enforced by the U.S. Treasury Department of Foreign Assets Control. Right. This particular organization applies to foreign companies that engage in certain prohibited activity with Iran, as discussed below, under certain circumstances, this particular agency also adds new liabilities to U.S. companies that have relationships with these foreign offenders. 
you also cannot do business with Iran. Now, I thought they wanted a free market. In a free market, I should be able to do business with whoever I want to do business with. If Iran calls me right now today, let's say I got an oil well. Iran calls me right now today and says, David, we want to buy oil from you. We'll pay you this price per barrel. I say, cool. I'm going to send it right through. The United States found out that I'm doing that. They can literally put me in jail for that. It's called doing business with the enemy. And I'm going to show you an example of what I'm talking about. Then they also going to tax me on the money that I got illegally. Because the U.S., the IRS, they will tax you on your illegal money, which is weird. Because if they say it's illegal, why are you going to tax me? But that's what they do. If uh, Cuba calls me up and says, David, we want you to come to Cuba. And we want you to teach this whatever, yada, yada, yada. And we're going to pay you said amount of money. And I say, cool, I'm going. The U.S. The State Department will get me and say, hey, David, you can't do business with Cuba. That's called doing business with the enemy. So the United States government forbids me as a business owner from doing business with company countries that they don't like. They got a list of them. They don't want me to do business with them, right? They have certain organizations that are not even countries, but they're just organizations that they don't like. They don't want me doing business with those either. And if I do, I'm going to get into a lot of trouble. They may try to lock me up. They may try to incarcerate me behind it. Some of these same people that are advocating for free markets would also advocate that I don't do business with these particular companies while talking about free markets. There are no free markets. They built this market to exert control over me as a market actor. They want to dictate who I do business with. Right. They don't want to allow me to do business with whoever I want to do business with because it works on my business. Let me give an example of what I'm talking about. So this is a story about a guy named Mark Rick. Mark Rick was a commodities trader. He ran a company called Glencore. Rick was indicted in 1983 for trading with the enemy and tax evasion by Rudy Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani, I'm sorry, then the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. But Rick's company, the switch based Mark Rick Plus Company, purchased approximately 60 to 75 million barrels of Iranian oil every year up to 1994 when Rick finally sold the company to management. The contract continued through the hostage crisis of 1979 to 81 after the USA had broken off diplomatic relationships and prohibited the import of Iranian crude oil. So when this particular interviewer replied that Mark was viewed as a crisis profiteer and a sanctions buster, he said, whatever we did, we did legally. We were doing business with Iran, Cuba and South Africa as a Swiss company. These businesses were completely legal, according to Swiss law. The U.S. government felt differently, though the Belgian-born Rick now holds Spanish and Israeli passports and has resided in Switzerland and Spain for years. U.S. prosecutors considered him a U.S. citizen who had violated the ban on doing business with Iran. So because the U.S. said he was a citizen of the United States, you violated our sanctions. And as a result, we can indict you and seek your arrest. Well, how come we can't just do business? We, we're doing free markets, right? We can't do business where we want to do business with. That's not how this works. So I'm telling you is that don't buy into this sky in the pot idea that if we just have free markets, everything will work out all right. That's not what we're, that's not the game we're playing right now. The game is a group of people build a market. They bring people in and they try to control what goes on the side of their market. Right. We haven't been taught this. Right. So we allow anybody to come around us and do business and we don't look to exert no control. No other group does that. Every other group builds a market. They let people come into the market, but they exert control over how you have to do business in that market. You cannot go to China and do whatever you want to do. They won't allow it. You have to do what they say you're going to do, but you just can't go over there and do whatever you want to do. It don't matter who you are. Nobody will be allowed to do that. You will leave and have to go do something else. We're the only people that are taught and we saw this with that Anglo-Saxon girl and you saw them Negroes bend over backwards to do that little bit of business they was going to do with her. And you see they have done no more business with her after that. That we should allow anybody to come amongst us and do business around us. And we don't look to exert control because we don't know how the game is played. Everybody else knows how the game is played. Right. This is how the game is played. So believe in this free market stuff. These people don't want free markets. What they want to be able to do is do what they want to do in the market while selling to you that it's free markets, okay? Let's keep going. Here's a particular article from a law firm called Smith, Gambrill, and Russell, right? 
Many Americans are probably aware that they're not, they, that they may not engage in business dealings with nations in which the United States has an antagonistic relationship, such as Cuba, Iraq, North Korea. But many people may not be aware that the U.S. aggressively enforces a broad range of economic sanctions against 12 countries or geographic areas and more than 3,500 organizations and individuals. So let's give you some examples, right? A Georgia company sent some of its employees to a convention and trade show held in Malta. Malta is an island, uh, I want to say west of Greece, or maybe it's west of Turkey, east of Greece, right? During the trip, the company is informed that the hotel is owned by a group of companies with connection to the Libyan government. The employees vacate the hotel the next day, but the company is forced to respond to formal inquiries from the U.S. Treasury Department. A California company using a broker charters a boat to carry products from Chile to Japan. Unbeknownst to the company, the owner of the charter boat has ties to the Cuban government. The company is hit with a $50,000 fine by the U.S. government for violating U.S. sanctions against Cuba. A Milwaukee company makes six shipments of television sets to a company in Panama. It turns out that the Panamanian company has ties to the Cuban government. The Milwaukee company is slapped with a $300,000 fine for violating the Trading with the Enemy Act, which is an actual act, right? So these incidents were results of the enforcement of the United States Economic Sanctions Program by the Office of Foreign Assets Control, a division of the United States Treasury Department. Office of Foreign Assets Control administers and enforces economic sanctions that are mandated by eight statutes. Trading with the Enemy, International Emergency Economic Powers Act, the Iraq Sanctions Act, the United States Participation Act, the International Security and Development Cooperation Act, the Cuban Democracy Act, the Cuban Liberty and, Dem and Democratic Solidarity Act, and the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, right? So these sanctions are, tar are targeted against a list of specified countries and against a list of specially designated nationals and block persons, right? So you gotta understand is that you cannot do business with whoever you wanna do as a US citizen. That's not how this game works. OK. And anybody telling you that they just want to build this world where anybody can just do whatever they want to do because that makes the most business sense for them. No, they don't. They're just telling you that because it sounds good. Right. This free market narrative is a lie. It killed the people on Ocean's Gate. It will kill you if you buy into it. Nobody builds markets for people to act freely in. Them. That's not how it works. Right. It doesn't work that way. People build markets to exert control over their marketplace. Smart people build markets so their group benefits from the market. Unintelligent people build markets and let other people come into their market and dictate to them or they build no market. Here's something that Erica talked about, and we're going to read out her super chat because I'm going to use her as an example of something she talked about. So Erica Williams, Classic Clown, Smart Phone Money, appreciate the $10 super chat. 38-year-old friend got pregnant along with seven women who were late 30s, early 40s, who are mostly management. The company had to get them to spread out their four months off so some manager be left. Definitely because you can't fire them because they're pregnant. Right? But there were jobs at one time would tell a woman, I'm not going to hire you, you're going to get pregnant. Or look for a way to get you off the job because you can't get pregnant. That's illegal. You can't do it inside the United States. But here's something that Erica talked about. I don't want to put words in her mouth, but she talked about it. She knew somebody that was working in, in hair care and they were black and they were trying to get a, a footprint in hair care, you know what I'm saying, in a particular geographic area, brick and mortar situation. And you know who locked them out? The Koreans. Because the Koreans officially have formed a cartel or syndicate to dominate hair care in black environments. Because they don't want you in. But yet we let them in, but they're not going to let you in. So they're going to look to block you out. This happened to a lot of black people running hair stores all over the country where they realize once they start trying to do over a certain level of business, they start trying to get on the wholesale level, start trying to get big shipments. Them Koreans start trying to block them out because that's their that's their vertical. That's their environment. That's their market. They don't want you in their market. But you would think, well, y'all serving black people. We don't care. This is our environment. We're going to control it. Right. They didn't build that market to let black people come into that market and start making money. They built that market for them to make money. 
And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. It's not your fault. It's how you've been educated. So you're never going to be able to, one, control your environment, control your markets, or build your own markets because you don't know how to. Many of you are anti-business. You don't like business, even though you like a business enough to go work for one, but you don't really like business that way, right? You're anti-people making money, but people can make money off of you that you don't know and don't look like you, but if people look like you and you know them, you don't want them making money off of you. So it's going to be very difficult for you to build markets. So you'll be one of those type of people to buy into this fake free market narrative. There are no free markets. That's not how this thing works. This game is not played that way. So to get you to really understand on this 4th of July holiday, there are no free markets. People build markets to exert control over them and market actors. I don't care what these entertainers tell you, right? I don't care what this CEO tried to do, right? Because if we really was playing the game by the free market rule, when that sub disappeared, everybody would have just said, oh, well, and moved on to the next situation. Nobody would have stopped to look for him because this man sought out to avoid any control over what he was doing. He wanted no regulation, no oversight, nothing over what he wanted to do, whatever he wanted to do. That's cool. When it go bad, keep doing whatever you want to do. You got to figure out how to get yourself up off the bottom of that ocean. That's not my job. That's your job. You built the machine. So that's what I want to encourage you to do. Don't get sidetracked in this. Learn how markets actually function. Learn how to build your own marketplaces and then learn how to connect with people to build better and more robust marketplaces and then learn how to protect your marketplaces. And anybody that doesn't want to do that, don't argue with them. You're going to be able to come into their environment and benefit from their lack of, of desire or their inability to build good marketplaces. Don't worry about what they're talking about. And you're going to have to create a structure to regulate what goes on in the market. You cannot allow free for all because that's exactly what you're going to get. Let's read these comments, man. Let's get up on out of here. Let me start from the top. So let me go ahead and do my super chats. Ray Gun, man, appreciate the $2 super chat. Brian Ash, I appreciate the 999 super chat. Uh, Erica, Classic Climb, Smartphone Money, appreciate the $10 super chat. And Mr. Lindell Moore, great info as always. All facts and hair cartel is real. Most definitely it is real, right? Lindell Moore, appreciate the $20 super chat. It's most definitely real. It's real, real, right? People don't understand that. And I'm not mad at them. They built that marketplace uh, because that works for them. Because South Koreans come from an extremely competitive environment and they know you got to compete. Right. Because South Korea is very, very competitive. OK, let's go ahead and read these comments, man. So Jalo says they want the government to fund the research hands off when it's time for profits and bail them out when stuff hits the fan. Definitely. That's exactly what they want. You know, a lot of the people that got caught up in that Silicon Valley bank deal. There's some of that same free market crowd we saw when they thought they was going to lose all their deposits. Now we want the Treasury and the Fed to come in and make us whole. But now we're on the hook for it as taxpayers. So it's free markets until we're going to lose some money in the deal. Then we want somebody else to come in and make us whole again. Then we go back to talking this free market stuff. This is just stuff they do to distract people, man. They don't really believe in this stuff. GC, what's up with it? Exactly. We talked about that. Some free market people are begging the Fed to come in and save SVB deposits that deposits over the FDIC insurance limit. Definitely. Right. People got $10 million in that bank, in one bank. Don't even make no sense. So Amika says, without proper regulation, the markets would deplete to the point that capital controls have to come in to prevent the flight. We saw this during the pandemic. I was trading during the pandemic. Uh, we kept getting um, circuit breakers. Because why? The circuit breakers is designed to stop money from leaving the market. Now, I didn't know that. That was my first time seeing a circuit breaker. So I'm trading with uh, another trader. And I'm like, what's going on? Because the market keeps stopping. I've seen tickers stop. I didn't know you could stop the whole spy. I didn't know you could do that, but they did it. And it's because it was so much risk off and money was fleeing the U.S. stock market so fast that they were stopping the market to stop the money from fleeing. Right? Then after about, I want to say a week of that, the Fed came in with liquidity to stop people from fleeing the market, to give people market confidence again. So the Fed and BlackRock came in to provide liquidity to the financial markets. And essentially what they did was they said, well, we're just going to buy everything up so that people know that there is some type of market demand for these particular securities and assets. Right. Well, the reason why other countries have their market implode is because they don't have a financial system that's robust enough to do that. 
and they may not have a country big enough to do that. This is a large company with a lot of people that pay a lot of taxes. So we can pay a lot of interest on debt. If I'm running a country of 10 million people, I can't pay but so much interest on debt, even if I got all my whole 10 million people working. So they can't do the financial things we can do. So this is why I say people got to really understand how markets function to really understand where a lot of this policy comes from. So JLD says, I learned there's a sales tax on illegal substances. I feel you. That's crazy. I know they tax you if you make your money illegally. So you can sell drugs, make a lot of money, go to jail for selling drugs, and the IRS will come in and, uh, what do you call that particular word? Um, it's not indict you, but the IRS will come in against the fact that you made so much money, right? You get audited, is what I told what I was meant to say. The IRS will come in and audit you for drug money because their attitude is we don't care that the money's illegal. We still want our money. It's weird, you know, but that's just what they do. So Erica says we had to use our biracial friend mom to make phone calls and deliveries. Eventually had to run us some paper. Definitely. Yeah, they, they got that thing locked up. And that's why they make so much money, because it's a cartel system. And I'm not mad at them. That's what you're supposed to do. But you can't convince certain people that that's what you're supposed to do. They want to argue with you. And I'm explaining something to you, Erica. I guarantee you none of them Koreans ain't argue about, well, how come I can't do business with this black person? See? But we got Negroes arguing on YouTube about that Anglo-Saxon girl who ain't doing no business with them. You know, they, they got to go so much against the grain. And I don't understand what the benefit is to it. Ain't like she got a million dollar deal for y'all on the other side of the situation. But that's just how people are conditioned. You know, it's easy to separate and divide certain folk. It's just it's easy. Everybody know it, too. So, but yeah, certain people, man, they not going to break. They not going to split against a group to do business with me. They just not going to do it because I don't have enough business for them to do that. They're going to stick with the people they always been making money with. But, you know, it is what it is. So you 100 percent correct. It was a really good documentary on that. So Erica says the boss got in trouble saying they got pregnant at the same time. Basically, was calling the ladies old and a joke. Yeah, I feel you. Yeah, it can it can get it can. You got to really watch, especially dealing with women on the job now, especially pregnant women. You got to watch how you deal with them. because You can get yourself into a lot of trouble because you can't create any environment where they got to feel like they can't get pregnant. They're going to lose their situation. You also can't make it to where when they come back, they feel like they're being uh, retaliated against because they left the job. They got to come right back into what they left when they when they got pregnant. That's just how the world works now. It used to be a woman could get pregnant and come back and she come back to nothing. You used to be able to do women like that. You can't do them like that no more. So L Light says we don't have the game day. We know not to get in the air control or lock it down. I hope so. Erica says many folks don't want to pay for ads, so they do the collaboration technique all over YouTube. Yeah, you're right. I don't understand, Eric, if you're making over a certain amount of money, why you're not at least running a thousand a month in ads. These people's channels too big. They're not even doing a thousand a month in ads. They can just do brand awareness ads just to get videos out there. It don't make no sense, but that's just how they want to run their channel. You know, everybody run their channel the way they run it. But, yeah, but you see all those people that stood up for that Anglo-Saxon woman, they don't have no deal on the other side of that. Right? So I don't know what I don't know what they stood up. She's not gonna stand up for them like that. But you know, that's how these you know, this is why you can just do anything to certain folks, man. You can just do anything to them because it's so easy to divide them. So here's the crazy part: it's a famous construction company, Austin, that won an award for having so many women on staff. I feel you. So self-made SM five dollars. Appreciate the information. I appreciate the five dollar super chat. So that's all we're gonna talk about, you know. Uh, don't buy into the free market narrative. Um, build markets, control markets for the best benefit of you and your group and control the actors in your market. Don't let people come into your market and do whatever they want to do. Right. Regulation is not bad. Right. It's that we may want to change the rules, but many of you do not want to function in an unregulated market. You, th It sounds good till you actually got to deal with what's the reality of the situation. Right. So I would encourage you to really learn how markets function, really how they function, not just, you know, listen to what people say on YouTube, really do the work to learn how markets function so you can go and build markets on behalf of your group. You can build economic systems on behalf of your group that benefit your group. And if you don't want to do that, then you just have to deal with what other people have built for you. 
But don't let people distract you, making you think, well, we're just going to build out this free market environment. Everybody's just going to do whatever they want to do with no government regulation. It doesn't exist. Right. That, that just doesn't work that way. OK, you wouldn't have the federal highway system without government regulation, which is the reason why we can do commerce so easily inside the United States. OK, some of these anti-government people are some of the biggest pro-government people that you'll ever meet. It's entertainment for them. Right. It's just like I'm going to watch a movie. Uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, the guy that's playing the guy who is the leader of was a shield. Right. Forgot the guy's name. The black guy. It's a role. He's really not that person. I can't make myself believe he's that person. OK, and so that's what I really want to encourage you is don't buy into some of these way out narratives from people uh, that don't match up to real life. Deal with real life people that's giving you real good actionable information that you can deal with in your real life. Some of them posted on the YouTube. You got Erica. We got you to buy the hood. We got other people. Miss Cherie, Miss Dana with the data. Judge Joe Brown. Get with real people. Yeah, Nook Furry, Samuel Jackson. Yeah, you know, I don't even watch TV, man, so I don't even be knowing how these people name like that. But, like, that's a role he's playing in the TV show. That's really not who he is. So deal with people, man, that's really about what they're about and learn from them and just let the entertainers be entertainers, man. But don't let these people. Samuel L. Jackson cannot get me to believe that he's really Nick Fury and he's really going to free the world from whoever. And I'm going to buy into that. It's entertainment, bro. It's like WWE wrestling, right? So that's what I want to really encourage you not to get caught up in. Hope you got some value from it. David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave, I'll talk to you later.